I am so excited. I have a milestone CEO. She is extraordinary. Kara Golden, she is the CEO of Hint and founder. She also is an author. And of course, like everybody else on earth, she is now a podcast host. Welcome to the playbook, Kara. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Thanks for having me. You know, what's so amazing. I'm looking at all your accomplishments and I call you a milestone CEO because I have three daughters and I believe in legacies and milestones. Uh, my business partner is Hall of Fame quarterback Warren Moon, and I would always call him a milestone. And he would ask me, what do you mean by that? I said, because without you, people don't know where to go past. <laughs> and we need people out there. Not only, you know, I think we limit ourselves when we say, oh, you know, without someone like Kara Golden, a founder, a CEO of a huge company, you know, my girls aren't going to you know, be able to achieve it without seeing it. No, I, I think they'll be able to achieve certain things, but I think it makes it so much easier to go past you, to think way bigger and not only think of you as a possibility, but a probability for their lives, uh, being young women entrepreneurs of not only what they can do, but how they can do better than we do. And have you ever taken that perspective of a milestone? Uh, and who were the milestones when you were growing up trying to dream of being this extraordinary entrepreneur? Yeah, well, thank you. I, you know, for me, more than anything, number one, first of all, I, I think you're so terrific. And, <laughs> and uh, we've, we're, very, very thankful for uh, having you on on my podcast as, as well and talking a bit more about your life. And it, it it really boils down to doing what I love and doing something that has purpose and solving problems. And so, you know, whether that's for uh, college students who are women or men, or I, I, I'm always trying to really push on the fact that I think happiness comes from doing what you love. And I think so often we kind of lose that perspective, particularly when we get out into the real world, we think, okay, we've got to go make lots of money. We've got to go be a big title. And I am constantly even pushing on people my age to say, do you like what you're doing? Because if you don't really like what you're doing at the end of the day, then it shows eventually it catches up to you. And so I didn't plan on being an entrepreneur. I, I worked for some entrepreneurial people and, and did some really fun stuff along the way. But ultimately what I decided to do was was really focus on what I was interested in and in, in health and and that's how it ended up getting started. So I hope that message gets out to people. Uh, it's not just about me being a beverage entrepreneur, which I guess I am, but really somebody who focused on something that interested me. And that was 15 years ago. So sort of another big message, I think, too, to people is that, you know, when you're doing something that you're really interested in, and maybe other people don't really understand what you're talking about, I guess you call them visionary CEOs it might take you a little while, right? That you might be the only one out there, but you're doing something that, you know, has to catch on in, in some way. And, and in our case, creating an entirely new category. But just getting back to your question, who were the people when I moved to Silicon Valley back in uh, end of 1994, the only person that sort of equated to Silicon Valley for me was Steve Jobs. And in a, and I had lived in New York and uh, worked in journalism. And when I moved to Silicon Valley, I didn't know anybody. And I thought, that'd be so cool if I could get a job at Apple. I had had a, a Macintosh um, and and early on in, in college, one of the first ones, and I and for me, Apple and Steve Jobs equated to taking these giant computers that were so not usable and creating a smaller version, larger than what we have today. And from a design perspective, making it something that you actually wanted to use. And so I couldn't Get, I didn't think I could get a job. I doubted that I could get a job at Apple because I didn't have tech experience. But for me, it was, how do I figure out how do I get in there? And how do I get into Apple? And I couldn't figure that out. Uh, 
didn't try super hard, I guess, thinking back on it, but I used, uh, you were talking about Westlaw, that Nexus, Nexus Lexus, I yeah, Lexus, married Nexus. to a, a <laughs> lawyer. And so I was using his Nexus Lexus back in the day to try and figure out what were the companies that Steve Jobs was attached to in some way, whether he invested or advising, and there was a spin out of Apple. And so I thought, huh, it's like probably pretty small. Maybe I could get it or something there. And, and so I cold called and reached out to this little CD-ROM shopping company that was a little known Steve Jobs idea, hoping that I would actually get to meet Steve or work with Steve. Never happened. Uh, it, but but I, think, I think for me, I just didn't take it that seriously. I felt like it was, you know, what was the worst that could happen? That if I, if I tried, you know, to get a role there, then, you know, and it didn't happen, then I'd be no worse off than I was when I didn't try. Right. I mean, it just, I, I never really thought of it that, that seriously, but anyway, long-winded answer that I, I think that the key thing that I hope people get out of hearing my story in my career is that it, find that thing that you are curious about that you have an idea to solve or you want to join something that you feel like has purpose and mission that really makes you happy don't go along with the crowd who is maybe going into tech roles or wall street or whatever figure it out what you want to do ultimately and also know that you can actually change too you don't have to be that for your whole life. And you, and because your interests will change. I mean, you know, your interests have changed, right? My interests have changed and, and that's okay. So that is what I hope people will understand. You know, it, it's so interesting because I'm blessed like you. And, you know, I was joking around about like everyone else having a podcast because there's really 99% of the podcast, then there's the Kara Golden Show and ones like that, that uh, actually have a community and a message and empower people. And I'm not discouraging people. I don't want to be one of the doubters in, in negatrons out there. I think everyone should share their frequency and grow a show that has the importance and impact that the Kara Golden Show has. But there's an interesting reconciliation I see uh, between you and a lot of the other, you know, I've been with the billionaires, millionaires, entrepreneurs, athletes, celebrities, entertainers, hyper successful people. You call yourself and explain yourself as this accidental entrepreneur. You write a book called Undaunted, Overcoming Doubt and Doubters. And I was curious how you reconcile this obvious desire that you must be what you can be, that you're not going to listen to the inter hater as well as the outside haters. Uh, and you're specifically directed towards what makes you happy, what you're passionate, purposeful, and hopefully profitable about. But yet it all falls, un falls under this guise of an accidental entrepreneur where most other entrepreneurs would define themselves as extremely purposeful and passionate and directed where you have almost a humility or some sort of obsequiousness to your success that you've overcome all these things. You're undaunted, but yet you accidentally got there. Yeah. And I think it really boils down to, I, I feel like, people want to put entrepreneurs in this box that, you know, they're, they're born with it, or they always knew since a young age that they were going to be an entrepreneur. And I've always kind of scratched my head when people have said that to me, because I don't know, like, I don't know that that was me necessarily, but what I did know and what I can always uh, sort of make claim to is that I was always super curious and I was the last of five kids. I was always asking, you know, bothering my parents and saying, why, why, why? I, I came after two pretty uh, naughty brothers who had lots of fun. And uh, and so my birthing order sort of, you know, caused me, unfortunately, to have to always when my parents said no, which was quite fast, I said, why, why? You know, I was always that kid. And and I guess what what I realized is it early on was that if I really set my mind to something and I really wanted to do something, I just had to just go and figure it out. And so when I 
got to college and and started looking around for careers. I had I was a journalism major and I was a minor in finance. And for me, I I just I looked at all the companies that were coming on campus and none of the ones that I thought were like dreamy jobs were coming on campus. So I remember people saying, well, just start somewhere. And I, th I thought, well, if I start there, I don't know if I'm going to be that excited. Do I want to move to a new city and go and work at that when I'm not really that psyched about it? I mean, will I actually looking back on things that I sort of did, you know, because I felt like I had to, I kind of wasn't that psyched about it and it showed. Right. And, and so for, for me, I thought, well, that's one choice, but the other choice is just to go and find it. And, and that's exactly what I did. And, and I think that through stories, whether I was speaking on college campuses or talking to other entrepreneurs or, you know, just talking to people who were just trying to figure out life, I just thought, you know, being actually sharing my story of, I, I never really had all the answers. I still don't. I still view life as a big puzzle that just doesn't end. And then I'm just figuring it out. And hopefully I'm helping people. And I believe I'm helping people, not only with my product hint, helping people drink water and realize what they're putting into their body, but also with the book, I feel like you know, there's definitely times along the way where I've had doubts, I've run into doubters, I've had failures along the way, and owning those things allows you to be able to move forward, right? And and use those learnings. And I know you and I have talked about that as well. And so I think more than anything, that that is that is kind of who I've been, and and something that I've really wanted to share with people. That's phenomenal. You know, I look at your career and it's really a three part series of you seem always to be happy where you're at. And I think a lot of people, not just entrepreneurs, never take the time to be happy where they are, you know, to know mm -hmm. that they have what they need. You, you just have this calmness uh, and security about, OK, I'm good where I'm at, uh, but you're willing to do everything it takes to get to where you want to be. But the interesting component is your faith. And I think that's why you wrote the book on Daunted, uh, you know, Doubts and Doubters, is that regardless of that effort that you're putting in, somehow you have not only the security that you're happy where you are, but you're happy where you will be, meaning you have this great sense of faith that I'm going to end up somewhere better. And I really don't know where <laughs> or, or why, but I'm going to end up somewhere better. And I think that is a common denominator between a lot of successful people in pursuing what they love and being happy and all the non-tangible uh, adjectives that people utilize to be successful. What is it, you know, maybe you could tell me a story of overcoming the doubt and doubters uh, and displaying that faith uh, in this circumstance that obviously you've had multiple times in your life. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, I share, a lot of these stories in, in my book, but, you know, one, I, I realized probably about a year into my, my, uh, journey in, in building hint, I was, I was just working my tail off. I had four kids under the age of six. So I was not the profile of somebody who you'd want to bank on, right. Starting a company <laughs> in a new industry that I had no experience in. And uh, I was tired, right? I was just really trying to figure out a lot of stuff around distribution of our product and, uh, and then also how to actually make the product so I'd get a great shelf life and be able to stay in Whole Foods. And that's when a friend connected me with somebody pretty senior at, at Coca-Cola and about 15 minutes into my sales pitch about why they should want to work with us in some way and hoping that I could get my product on the Coke uh, trucks. That's when uh, the gentleman uh, interrupted me and said, sweetie, Americans love sweet. This product isn't going anywhere. And I was like, oh, whoa, what, what just happened? I, I just hadn't never really been called sweetie. And uh, <laughs> I was just a little shocked as my dad said to me, I'm glad you weren't sitting across the table, that it was a phone call that probably would have ended really badly. <laughs> and I, and I, I just, people have asked me over the years when I've shared that story, they've said, why didn't you, you know, say something or, you know, say, excuse me or hang up the phone. And 
I don't know why I didn't do it. I was just a little shocked. And I just sat there and listened for the next 45 minutes. And that's when I realized that his mission was very different than my mission. My mission in starting Hint was to get get myself off of diet soda, diet Coke in particular, but get me to drink water because I hated the taste of plain water. So I started slicing fruit in the water and I wanted a water that didn't have sweeteners in it. And the closest thing to that was like vitamin water. If you remember 15 years ago, I mean, they were in their heyday eventually. I just have to interrupt you because everyone needs to know this. This is why exactly why I drink Hint water. (laughs) <laughs> what you just described is exactly the process that went through my mind is I don't, I want to stop drinking Diet Coke. I hate regular water. And so I put lemon in all my waters and yeah. then other, fr- and like, then Hint Water came out and I was like, hey, I don't have to do this myself. <laughs> this right. Is and that was, and that was me. And it seems <laughs> totally, I mean, why wouldn't you want Hint Water? But, you know, a longer story, but, you know, the challenges when, when you're the only one that's actually on your page, uh, on this whole concept of an unsweetened flavor, flavored water, it's good and bad because we would say to buyers in grocery stores, hey, we've got an unsweetened flavored water. It's really different. And they'd say, what's it sweetened with? I'm like, are you listening? This is unsweetened. <laughs> and they, and you know, and again, consumers didn't get it either. They'd say, oh, it doesn't taste as sweet as vitamin water. Exactly. <laughs> well, but why would we drink it? And I, I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, you have to understand that when you're the only one there and you're starting a new category and Steve Jobs talked about this a lot and other people who have started categories in different industries have talked about this a lot. It's lonely, right? You've got your doubts and you've got your doubters. But for me, I was so excited to talk to this gentleman and, you know, this huge company that had way more experience than me. But after that conversation, what I realized was that it, he was on a totally different river, right? And that there was just forget about health for a minute. I mean, he was talking about how this consumer really wanted zero calories at the time. Diet was, if you remember, was like 10 calories. And so they hadn't perfected zero calories, but that was their focus was to perfect zero calories. And they believe that if they could perfect the zero calories, then you would trick consumers into thinking that it was healthier than it was. And I was thinking, yeah, but if it's not healthier and that's what I figured out, then won't the consumer eventually figure it out? And, and what his response was, no, they're just focused on zero. And I thought, wow, the world is filled with healthy perception versus healthy reality. And no one cares. And I just thought that that was so sad on so many levels. And and again, this is, I'm a tech executive. I'm, I'm a journalism major. I am not supposed to be in this space, but I knew that there was this stuff going on that really tricked consumers. And again, I had been doing this now for a year and I kept, I was hearing from consumers from day one of getting our product on the shelf at Whole Foods that we were helping people drink water. It was the first time I'd heard about this disease called type two diabetes 15 years ago, where I was fascinated when I would pick up those customer service calls from people who were drinking our product and people would talk to me about it. And they'd say, yeah, I'm a marathon runner. I drink diet and I've got this thing. And they would almost be apologizing about it. And they'd say, you know, I just wanted something without the diet sweeteners because I heard your story. And I thought, wow, maybe that's, that's what my issue is. Maybe these diet sweeteners are really what are causing me weight gain and some of these other diseases. And, you know, my response would always be, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but maybe just try things and make switches along the way. And, and not having the industry experience going at it from a curiosity standpoint and helping people was what drove me. So when I hung up the phone that day, that's when I said, I have a choice. I either quit which I think this executive at Coca-Cola thought I was going to do, or 
I have a responsibility to consumers to continue. And as long as I was interested and still curious, and I mean, I swear every day I'd wake up and I'd think, okay, what do I have to do next? Where else, like how else, what is that problem that I'm going to go solve today? I didn't sit there and say, I'm going to go solve 15 problems. I took one or two problems and I'd say every day I would go and focus on those things. And, and so again, sharing those stories with other entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter if you're not in the beverage industry, it matters just the, the mechanics, right. Of the whole, how did you go figure it out? And again, I was only staying there as long as I was interested too. And so that I think is something, it's a huge lesson for people when, when I, you know, share with people that, you know, being an entrepreneur is incredibly hard, but as long as you're interested, as long as you wake up every single day and you want to be doing what you're doing and you feel like you're making progress and you're going to have failures along the way, but, you know, you're also going to have successes and things we eventually figured out our distribution and how to actually get a longer shelf life. And, all these things. I mean, today, you know, funny thing really quickly about seven years ago, we launched our direct to consumer business and there were more articles from beverage executives saying, you know, this crazy lady in San Francisco who, you know, starting or taking her tech experience and starting a direct to consumer business, ha ha ha, like beverages will never be sold online. Forget it. And, you know, I just was like, okay, what, whatever, that's fine. Today, I mean, as soon as the pandemic hit, I, Pepsi announced that they were putting 300 million into building out a direct to consumer arm in, inside of the company. I was like, oh, should I show those articles to them? Like those <laughs> ones from seven years ago? Because I remember them. I remember they doubted it. And we've been doing this for seven years now. And, you know, we had a huge amount of people who were ready to just shop from us online back then. And that continued to build. And so again, that's over 50% of our overall business. And I've talked to many beverage executives who, you know, sold early on uh, vitamin water as well as Zico and Honest. And, you know, the main reason they couldn't figure out how to build their company without, those trucks from Coke or Pepsi or Dr. Pepper Snapple. And that was kind of, you know, what they say was sort of this hurdle, this, this block in front of them. And, and I think, again, it's be coming from outside of the industry, bringing different insights and different types of experiences, really the key to kind of building something new. Yeah, it's so interesting because it was down to the trucks and the shelf placement. Nobody could get around with the big distributors yeah. like Coke. Um, it's interesting, you know, you have... Your podcast, The Kara Golden Show, the book, Undaunted, Overcoming Doubters and Doubts and Doubters, uh, and then Hint, and all three ring true with a, a, a story that, and it's a motto of mine, right? First, they're going to laugh at you, then they scoff at you and make fun of you, uh, but according to what I'm looking at through my due diligence, then they applaud you because I think you have won more empowering women, entrepreneurial Entrepreneur of the Year, Women to Watch. I could list them out in, uh, you know, and embarrass you, but they're definitely applauding you today. They applaud your podcast, they applaud your book, and they certainly applaud you and your company uh, of leading the way of believing in yourself and executing on that belief, which are two entirely different things. It has been an honor and a pleasure to have the incredible entrepreneur, Kara Golden, author, podcast host, founder and CEO of Hint, and an incredible new friend of mine. Thank you for joining me.